New York City is out in force tonight for the send-off to Seinfeld. Good evening. For a show about nothing, it's getting quite a farewell. Indeed it is. From their living rooms to Times Square to parties all around New York City, people said goodbye to four lovable neurotics who have given us nine years of laughter. After all the hype, tonight was the night that Seinfeld signed off. So you will miss Seinfeld? Yes. I think I'll miss it because it's just a pastime. It's just become a habit. 76.3 million. That is how many viewers tuned in for the finale of one of the greatest, most groundbreaking, and beloved television sitcoms of all time. The fourth largest audience for a series finale in television history, the conclusion of a classic, the end of an era. Despite the fact that for 10 years, the American people tuned in religiously week after week to bear witness to the selfish, irresponsible, and often socially inept shenanigans of Jerry, George, Elaine, and Kramer, upon the airing of the finale, where our four leads are put on trial for standing by as an innocent man is mugged and several of the characters they slighted throughout the series take the stand to recall just how awful these individuals truly are, leading to them being sent to prison as the series comes to a close, fans went apeshit. While you will often see the word polarizing being thrown out a lot in regard to a number of series finales, the finale of Seinfeld really doesn't fall under that purview, as it was pretty much resoundingly hated by both fans and critics. And unlike other divisive finales, such as the ending of The Sopranos, it hasn't exactly been granted widespread retrospective appreciation, even to this day being remembered as one of the most disappointing finales in television history. But that leaves the question, why? Originally, this video was simply going to be a breakdown and defense of the final episode, but upon rewatching the episode itself, well, there actually was nothing to comment on. I'd argue the finale is perfectly consistent with the tone of, and a thematically fitting conclusion to, the series. So why did fans react in such a hostile manner? Why did them finally seeing these four unabashedly narcissistic individuals receive their comeuppance rub so many the wrong way? Well, if you will indulge me in a drawn-out, pretentious video essay that touches upon an array of topics, from the audience's deeper relationship with mass media entertainment to Sigmund Freud's theory of the unconscious, I would be happy to present a theory. Before we begin, I will be discussing a number of shows throughout this video, so if you don't want any of them possibly spoiled, make sure you check the description where I will list them. Also, a big thanks to those in my Discord who helped me sort out my ideas for this video, as there was a point in drafting the script where I thought I was completely losing my mind. With all of that said, let's set the stage. The relationship between media entertainment and those who consume it has been the subject of an overwhelming amount of research, discussion, and controversy. Perhaps one of the most prominent aspects of this conversation is the connection between violent content, whether it be movies, television, music, or video games, and real-world violence. A conversation that was pushed to the forefront, particularly after the Columbine High School Massacre of 1999. However, despite this conversation continuing to rear its head even to this day, the connection between violent media and real-world violence is minuscule to say the least. While there have been studies that have linked violent media to increased aggression, the vast majority of said studies have been criticized by the scientific community for either them being shoddily constructed or politically biased. Among the studies that have been peer reviewed, only about half or so find some sort of link between violent media and increased aggression. And none of the studies showed any sort of connection between violent media and actual violent behavior. But then this leaves the question, why? How is it that watching shocking and violent content doesn't seem to have all that much of an effect on the audience? Well, at the risk of sounding like a completely unscientific, uneducated imbecile, I'd argue the reason there doesn't seem to be any sort of major effect on the viewing public is because, well, it's not real. This is why we can see someone get capped in the head on television and not be traumatized as we may be if we saw it happen while stepping out our front door. Despite how invested in a show or movie one may be, and despite the fact that it can elicit a wide array of emotions, there is always this fourth wall barrier, if you will. The sort of little nugget in the back of your head always knowing what you are watching isn't reality. 
This is why we can follow the stories of some truly depraved and vile characters and actually become invested in them rather than hightailing it the fuck away. Tony Soprano is a brilliantly layered and complex character, but is he someone I'd actually want to associate or say have a beer with, at the risk of him taking a banal comment of mine as a slight against him, leading to him beating me half to death with his bar stool, like the sociopath he is? Eh, I'll pass. And thus, no. Empathizing with Dexter Morgan isn't going to lead to people maybe reconsidering if Ted Bundy was all that bad of a guy. We know it's not real. We don't hold these fictional characters up to the same level of moral standing as we do in real life because we know they exist in a heightened reality. Or even shows that may look and feel real aren't. We don't necessarily judge characters based on real world standards because otherwise most shows probably wouldn't be as entertaining or funny as they would be horrifying or revolting. So why do I bring all this up? Well, like I said, when it comes to movie or television characters, we don't exactly see them as they actually are. We don't necessarily apply to them the standards of the real world and judge them accordingly, especially when it comes to comedies, as the exaggerated characters are often just as much so as their exaggerated worlds. And because of this, unless you actually took a second to look at some of the shows and characters you love, well, you may not have realized that and not to ruffle any feathers or be too harsh towards a beloved character of yours, but... As I said, the viewer may not always judge fictional characters by their actions at face value, as they would in a realized scenario. But there is another element to this, the level of self-awareness a show seemingly has about the fact that its characters may be horrible individuals. As I mentioned, Tony Soprano is a seething sociopath, but the show knows this. It's not like the show is trying to make you think Tony is a swell fellow. The show wants you to empathize with him, yes, but empathy is not the same thing as sympathy or likability. Even a show like Dexter doesn't necessarily frame Dexter as a good guy, but rather sets up scenarios where the viewer is left to ponder the morality of a given situation. However, then there are more ambiguous cases, especially when it comes to comedy. In, say, The Office, a character like Michael Scott is clearly meant to be a ridiculous caricature. From making light of Phyllis getting flashed in the parking lot, to his delicate handling of discovering Oscar's homosexuality, the comedic punch of his character's actions is more often than not derived from Michael's ineptitude and incompetence. He is the butt of the joke. But then there is, say... Now, obviously the show came out in the 90s, so not all of the jokes really land as well today, and in a lot of cases, the cringy things the characters do are framed where the characters are the butt of the joke, like Ross being weirded out by a male nanny, or Chandler being uncomfortable that his father is a drag queen, which was a, a really weird episode on so many levels, come to think of it. The show knows the characters are wrong, and has them eventually come around and learn from their mistakes. But then there are some questionable actions taken by the characters that are perhaps framed as less wrong and more just quirky when in actuality, they are just wrong. Rachel lying and telling other women her assistant was gay because she wanted to date him. Monica being convinced her mate is a thief and borderline sexually assaulting her. Chandler stealing a sex tape from Monica's ex's apartment as he thought it was a video of her. I'd probably say Friends is one of the most tame examples of what I am discussing, as I feel the characters, despite their flaws, overall aren't all that scumbaggy, if you will. But then we get into other shows where I can't believe someone, let alone an entire writer's room, thought up some of this shit. The fellas on The Big Bang Theory are all complete pervy assholes. Like, I get they are going for the humor coming from them being sort of socially inept, but there are times when the gags are less charmingly lovable and just, uh... Would you have opened the door if you knew it was me? Not since I found out the teddy bear you gave me had a webcam in it. <laughs> Pretty much everyone on Two Broke Girls, a show that if you get sent to hell, Satan puts on repeat on a shitty TV in a shitty hotel room and forces you to watch it in an endless loop, throws out Lord knows how many stereotype jokes, and I guess it is meant to be endearing? Just put it on. You can't tell an Asian he made a mistake. He'll go in the back and throw himself on a sword. Then there is How I Met Your Mother, a show that, for the life of me, I can't understand why it was so highly regarded even before the horrendous ending. Hey, Barney, there's a bunch of models in the lobby and the gossip is one of them is really a dude. You wanna play who's hot and who's Scott? Ha <laughs> ha! 
Now I know what some of you may be saying. Well maybe some of these characters are supposed to be this way. Maybe they are caricatures like Michael Scott. The problem with this concept is that satire is used far too often to hand wave what is actually bad, outdated, or just racist sexist comedy. Pop Culture Detective has a great video on this regarding the Big Bang Theory, and how while the show is at times self-reflective about questionable comedy, that doesn't mean that it's being satirical. A good rule of thumb for determining if an edgy or risque joke is satire is to try and determine who the butt of the joke is. In The Office, when Michael Scott assumes the IT guy is actually a suicide bomber, we are laughing at Michael's stupidity. That How I Met Your Mother scene where our three male leads slut shame women walking home from their post Halloween hookups? Looks like that French maid didn't turn down somebody's bed. <laughs> yeah, I don't really see the satirical angle here. For say the character of Ted Mosby, you have to ask yourself when watching the show, is he supposed to be framed as a needy obsessive borderline sociopath, or simply a misguided but ultimately sincere and good hearted dude, despite the fact he habitually betrays the boundaries of the several women he pursues over the course of the series. I'd say It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia is a good example of that question being cut and dry where the characters are so unapologetically and obviously horrible people that they are clearly framed as the ones you should be laughing at. The overall point I am making is that the level of self-awareness seemingly present in the show is important, as it indicates whether or not the show is explicitly condemning a character's particular action. Keep this in mind, as it will become vital a bit later on. But in any case, regardless of how actually terrible some of these sitcom characters may be, whether or not there is a level of self-awareness, relaying to them or enjoying the hijinks they get up to doesn't automatically make you a bad person. Because, once again, we know it's not real. We know these are actors in scripted scenarios. Despite the fact that someone may laugh at a shitty stereotype joke, that doesn't necessarily mean that if they came across a situation like this in real life, that they would react the same way. Again, it goes back to that fourth wall barrier, a certain dissonance between what we are seeing and how we respond to it. It's almost as if we as an audience make an invisible handshake with the creators of the show. In video games, this handshake, if you will, comes in the form of looking past what has been coined ludonarrative dissonance. An example of this is how the character Nathan Drake of the Uncharted series, despite the fact that he is meant to be seen as a warm, likable family man, kills lord knows how many people over the course of the series. This dissonance exists in video games in other ways, particularly in terms of gameplay. For example, how enemies will keel over in one or two hits, but your playable character can take about 50 shots to the chest and then patch themselves up by wrapping like a bandage around their arm or something. We as players realize, no matter how realistic the game may seem, that if things were too emulative of real life, well, most games would suck. Same deal in television shows, and again, especially comedies. In real life, working for Michael Scott would be miserable and a PR nightmare, with him having been fired and likely sued many times over but I have a feeling that wouldn't make for as much of an entertaining series. We as the audience agree to offer a certain level of suspension of disbelief by understanding the characters exist in a heightened reality in exchange for entertainment. Take Homer Simpson. We are able to find him charming and endearing as we laugh at his antics, despite the fact that anyone who actually dozed off at their job at a nuclear power plant, drank in excess pretty much on a daily basis, and wrung his son's neck on the reg would be seen as a pariah of society. Just, you call that saying grace? But what if a show broke that deal? What if they drew attention to said dissonance, to just how horrendous a beloved character truly was? What if instead of keeping it light and fun, they hit you with something so over the top that they were almost able to make you feel guilty for having identified with a particular character, making you feel as if they were judging you, calling you out for even being able to relate to such a bad, bad person? Oh, you know what time it is. In 1997, The Simpsons released what is perhaps their darkest and most controversial episode, Season 8's Homer's Enemy. The episode begins by introducing a new character, Frank Grimes, or Grimy as he liked to be called, as a new employee at the Springfield Power Plant. Unlike pretty much every other character on the show, Grimes is considerate, does his work, basically he is a realistic character in what is a ridiculously over-the-top world. Immediately upon meeting the man, Frank is astounded by Homer's laziness, ineptitude, and the fact that despite him being a walking safety hazard, everyone else considers him quirky and lovable. Grimes tries to make those around him see how bad a person Homer is, but to no avail. 
which in turn leads to Grimes suffering from a mental breakdown, resulting in his death. The final scene shows Grimes' funeral, where Homer falls asleep, earning a rousing laugh from the other attendees as Frank's coffin is lowered into the ground. Yeah, not exactly the most lighthearted episode, if you will. Fan and critical reception was tumultuous to say the least. Seeing the character of Homer Simpson being framed as such a horrendous degenerate by contrasting him with the straight-edge Grimes wasn't pleasant for a lot of viewers, despite the fact that, as the episode draws attention to, on paper, Homer Simpson is in fact a horrendous degenerate. But this was, in effect, the entire point. In an interview in regard to the episode, Simpsons writer Josh Weinstein stated, We wanted to do an episode where the thinking was, what if a real-life normal person had to enter Homer's universe and deal with him? We wanted to show that in real life, being Homer Simpson could be really dangerous and life-threatening, as Frank Grimes sadly learned. We see the writers deliberately drawing attention to the dissonance I spoke of earlier, breaking the invisible handshake they made with the audience, if you will. In the scene where Frank flips out after Homer wins top prize at a science fair meant for children, when Frank turns to the audience and asks them what the hell is wrong with them, this might as well have been the writers coming on screen and yelling at the viewers at home asking how they could possibly allow a person like Homer Simpson to continue in his ways uncondemned. So with that in mind, you can sort of see why the episode turned off so many fans, with them perhaps feeling as if they were being made to reflect on, or even feel guilty about, looking past Homer's incredible dysfunction. As if the creators for the past eight years had been encouraging them to laugh along with the show's wacky characters, but then calling them out for doing so. And as evident by the episode's reception, this is not something the audience appreciates. So with all of that setting the stage, let's move on to... Seinfeld undoubtedly broke a lot of ground, but the one aspect that set it apart from pretty much any other show up until that time is that Seinfeld could be said to be the first postmodern sitcom. There's a great video by YouTuber Will Schoeder that discusses this, but allow me to give you the skinny. The vast majority of sitcoms up until the 90s tended to have a sentimental and or a teaching vibe. No matter what the characters would get up to, they would often find their way through it with the help of their friends and family. Most episodes would end with a general lesson that the audience could walk away with. Even a lot of shows nowadays that have postmodern elements still balance their show's more wacky antics with emotion and heart. And then there's Seinfeld. The characters have hardly any redeeming qualities, the debacles they find themselves in are usually brought about by their own egos and selfishness, and in the end, the resolution to each episode rarely really says anything about life, or the human condition, or the virtues of being honest, or the value of friendship. And this is sort of what the show about nothing tagline came to mean. While Jerry Seinfeld has said that the whole show about nothing thing wasn't what he and Larry David were going for when they conceived the show, and it was simply more of a meta inside joke, it seemed to take take on a life of its own and serve as a pretty succinct encapsulation of the vibe of the series. No lessons are learned or taught, the characters don't grow or come to epiphanies, and as for any sort of grand message, there's nothing. However, despite this, viewers still fell in love with the show and related to the characters, despite them being, of all the other characters I have mentioned thus far, the absolute worst of the bunch. While some of the other characters may just be goofy or have little quirks, Jerry, George, Elaine, and Kramer could only readily be described as some of the most narcissistic individuals ever portrayed in a sitcom. Jerry slipping his date sleeping pills so he can play with her toy collection, Elaine putting the soup Nazi out of business, effectively destroying his livelihood for rather petty reasons, George bum-rushing an old lady in a walker and several children in order to escape a small kitchen fire, and then passionately defending said actions. I risked my life making sure that exit was clear. <laughs> Kramer kidnapping a dog and abandoning it, and once again, none of these characters ever doing these things for a greater good or coming to learn the error of their ways. It could, in many ways, be seen as a satirical look at traditional sitcoms themselves. The anti-sitcom, if you will. But again, it's no big deal. Like I mentioned regarding shows like Friends, How I Met Your Mother, or The Big Bang Theory, even if the characters do things that could be seen as pretty shitty, and even if the shows at times may seem to lack the self-awareness I spoke of earlier, these shows still have the heart, if you will, of sitcoms of the past. There are lessons about friendship, family, and all sorts of other general modernist themes, if you will. Despite what they may do or say, 
there is at least some sort of a chance at redemption. Well, I mean, sure, Seinfeld doesn't have any of that pansy shit, as we discussed. Well, maybe despite their flaws, it's the desire to better themselves and learn from their mistakes. Uh, oh yeah, they, they don't really have that either. Um, so maybe it's, uh, uh, well, it's, uh, wh what exactly is Seinfeld's appeal? As I discussed earlier, audiences tend to not take a television character's actions at face value due to the nature of the medium. We understand that these characters exist in a heightened reality, and at times, them being less than exemplary citizens leads to humorous situations. But what if in some cases, we aren't exactly just looking past a character's selfish or improper actions as a means to an end? Following the Sopranos series finale, creator David Chase spoke out against what he felt was a hypocrisy on the part of the show's audience in regard to how they want Tony's story to end. The way I see it is that Tony Soprano had been people's alter ego. They had gleefully watched him rob, kill, pillage, lie, and cheat. They had cheered him on. And then, all of a sudden, they wanted to see him punished for all that. They wanted justice. They wanted to see his brains splattered on the wall. I thought that was disgusting, frankly. The pathetic thing to me was how much they wanted his blood after cheering him on for eight years. Chase got the impression that the audience wasn't just observing Tony's story, but that they were to some extent using him to fulfill their own desires. Whether it was Tony's strength or status, viewers reveled in seeing Tony do, say, and take what he wanted without consequences. This is a topic that has quite a bit of research behind it, regarding the purpose of narratives for the audience aside from just general entertainment, that purpose being vicarious wish fulfillment. Despite the mouthful the term may be, it's a pretty simple concept. When a person watches a movie or a show, or reads a book, it isn't just them observing the story as an impartial party, but oftentimes, they may sort of project themselves onto the character, tapping into their emotions and actions as a way to play out their own fantasies. How many of you watching have ever seen a scene where a disgruntled worker tells their boss to go fuck themselves? Wasn't it super satisfying? But was it so because you were simply happy for the character, or because you were also expressing a deeper desire within yourself? I am sure most of you watching have been in a situation where you just wanted to tell your boss or some other asshole off, but you don't because there may be consequences. This brings up Sigmund Freud's concept of the ego and the id. To put it in very basic terms, the id is the part of you that represents your inner desires, the part of you that just wants to maximize pleasure. The ego is the part of you that sort of keeps those desires in check, measuring risk versus reward. The id wants you to party till the sun comes up, the ego drags your ass home at a reasonable hour so you aren't late for work the next day. But in a story, not only can you experience that satisfaction in a way that is specifically designed to play out as satisfying as possible, sort of akin to a shower argument if you will, but there are no consequences, well, at least not for you. Action films offer you the sensation of being a badass ass kicker without racking up an obscene hospital bill. Romance stories can give you the thrill of a forbidden affair without it resulting in Laura Dern fucking your shit up. There are even some stories that have colloquially been dubbed power fantasies, where the protagonist may be purposefully underdeveloped and overly competent and or strong for the purpose of the person experiencing the story to be able to project themselves onto the character and indulge in being an all-powerful badass. To bring this back to video games, much effort is often given to simulate this sort of immersion. First person POV, perhaps silent or nameless protagonists, and of course, many RPGs that allow you to customize your character as you wish. So as for say, less than exemplary citizen sitcom characters, perhaps part of the reason we relate to them so much is that they sort of act out the part of us that we usually keep hidden. These characters can say and do things we would never, and while they may face consequences, it still allows us to achieve some sort of fulfillment in a secondhand fashion. It may not be we look past the not so nice things these characters do, perhaps they are part of the appeal. As I said, our four main leads are perhaps some of the most selfish, egotistical individuals ever put to the small screen. But again, is it that we on some level enjoy seeing these characters just doing what they want regardless of societal niceties? I would actually say that Seinfeld co-creator Larry David's follow-up, Curb Your Enthusiasm, continues with this idea, with Larry's show version of himself being the personification of the thing everyone is thinking but no one wants to say. He is basically a walking id, if you will. Maybe it is actually these characters doing these taboo and antisocial things that allows the audience to sort of let their own id run free a bit. It can be quite cathartic 
To see characters break and tear down the societal standards we are pressured to abide by on a day-to-day -day basis. Now don't mistake what I am saying. This isn't a bad thing in and of itself. Going back to when I spoke about many being fearful that watching violent media or playing violent video games can lead to real world violence, some theorists have suggested that they can actually have the opposite effect. Rather than exacerbating aggression, they can act as a sort of outlet, allowing viewers or players to indulge in their impulses in a way that doesn't lead to any real world consequences. This is another aspect of psychology, namely what effects suppression and repression can have on an individual. So perhaps individuals indulging in power fantasies or living vicariously through characters as a way to satiate their own urges is, to some extent, actually beneficial to society as a whole, allowing them to do so without any ill effects. But is there a catch? To go back to his musings about the audience's perception of Tony Soprano, David Chase was appalled at what he saw as the viewers indulging in Tony's moral debauchery but then desiring him to pay for it. Perhaps this was a case where the audience was able to express their id to live out a sort of power fantasy through Tony, but come the end of the series, their ego, in conjunction with their super ego, the part of your personality that basically serves as your moral compass if you will, told them that he must pay for all that he has done. But this is fine, right? People reveling in Tony taking what he wants and cracking skulls along the way doesn't have any real world consequences and may actually serve as an outlet for them, perhaps lowering the chance that they may act out their desire for strength and power in other ways. And the fact that they knew Tony had to pay for his misdeeds means they were conscious that he was not someone to emulate in the real world. Perhaps, but like with anything, there is always a flip side to that coin. There has been a lot of talk about the dangers of vicarious living, particularly when it comes to social media. Social media, as a sort of more manufactured portrayal of reality, has been well documented to have disastrous effects on individuals of all ages, making them feel depressed, anxious, and unworthy, mainly due to them comparing their lives to the more carefully cultivated perceptions they find on various social media platforms. The same sort of thing can happen with other types of media. I am sure you all remember back in 2009 when post-avatar depression was getting a lot of media attention. Reports of people suffering from depression and in some cases suicidal thoughts after leaving the film and realizing they would never be able to live on the beautiful planet of Pandora. Now after looking into this, as I am sure you can imagine, it was a little overblown. It's not like the phenomenon made its way into the DSM or anything. However, it was simply a single instance of what happened when people use media as a substitute for things they may be missing in their lives. It's one thing to enjoy a romance novel and get some temporary satiation or pleasure from reading about a steamy love affair. It's another to indulge in the romance of others to make up for the fact that you may be lacking any sort of desired romantic partnership in your life. Then there is the issue of toxic relationships being romanticized. Ross and Rachel and Friends, Ted and Robin and How I Met Your Mother, Twilight, Fifty Shades of Grey, The Notebook, examples of ridiculously toxic relationships that are romanticized by a significant portion of their fan base. Now you may be saying, well, this isn't necessarily fair, as it's not like everyone thinks these romance stories are ones that you should emulate in real life. It's entirely possible to enjoy these stories, but still understand that if the characters did some of the things they do in the story in real life, their significant others should run for the hills. But this simply isn't the case in other circumstances, especially when it comes to younger audiences and can create the impression that obsessive, paranoid, or downright coercive behavior is only proof of how much your partner truly cares for you. To go back to what I was saying about a level of self-awareness being important as a creator, there are actually two levels to this. A creator may create an immoral character, but frame their actions as clearly wrong in the show. Or they may not explicitly say so, but may be operating under the assumption that the viewer clearly knows the character's actions aren't meant to be emulated or celebrated. That is one level to it. But the other level is how the audience perceives the character. And this is where things get a little dicey. David Chase recognized that despite the fact that he never meant to portray Tony Soprano as someone the audience should look up to, some viewers may have seen Tony as a character whom they could use to live out their own desires, and because of this, perhaps some viewers didn't realize he was meant to be condemned as much as he was supposed to be. This is especially prominent when it comes to comedy. Dave Chappelle spoke of one particular moment that shook him while making The Chappelle Show in regard to an audience member's reaction to one of the show's sketches. The Black Pixie, 
played by Chappelle, wears blackface and tries to convince blacks to act in stereotypical ways. Chappelle thought the sketch was funny, the kind of thing his friends would laugh at. But at the taping, one spectator, a white man, laughed particularly loud and long. His laughter struck Chappelle as wrong, and he wondered if the new season of his show had gone from sending up stereotypes to merely reinforcing them. The character of Michael Scott may say racist or offensive things, but the point of the joke is to highlight Michael's absurdity as opposed to poking fun at the more vulnerable party. But that doesn't necessarily mean the audience takes it that way. It becomes even more testy when you have characters that are ostensibly pretty bad people and do bad things, but you are hoping the audience sort of gets they aren't supposed to be emulated. But again, there is no way to be able to guarantee they will. Was that wrong? <laughs> Before I continue, let me just clarify. I am not saying a creator not explicitly condemning something means they are promoting it. In the Chappelle example, Dave clearly was operating under the assumption that the audience was keen enough to realize the satire of the sketch. But again, while I am not saying that he should be condemned for other people not getting the joke, if you will, I am sure you can see how this may lead to a creator becoming a bit self-conscious and or double-guessing themselves, as Dave did, about whether or not they may be inadvertently promoting certain harmful ideas and stereotypes, even if this is as a result of the audience's inability to understand the nuance. So take the audience perhaps using characters as sort of proxies to live out their own not socially appropriate desires, and add in that, unless it is explicitly driven home, and even sometimes if it is, the audience may not perceive a character's actions, and thus the characters themselves, in as bad of a light as perhaps the creator wants them to. And what I think this may result in is the audience seeing certain characters through rose-colored glasses. Perhaps the most prominent and personal example of this is the character of Walter White from Breaking Bad. While I was not the biggest fan of the last season, I was a massive Breaking Bad stan during its run, obsessing over the show to a possibly unhealthy degree. But what I observed during the show's run, and hell even now, over seven years after its conclusion, was, I, I don't really know how else to describe it, but a worshipping of the character by some fans. While I think the character is one of the best ever conceived, even during the run of the show, even from the onset of the show, I personally was never unaware of the fact that Walter White was a fundamental piece of shit. Despite the setup of Walter having to resort to cooking meth to take care of his family after he passes, I'd argue it is crystal clear, even in the first season, that this is not his primary motivation, with that being more of a desire to enjoy an exciting and fulfilling life before his death. I would argue this is telegraphed many times throughout the series. And yet, Despite this, even to this day, I see a number of fans sort of idolizing him in a weird way. In some cases, defending his actions a little too strenuously, as if they were Walter himself trying to justify his immoral actions. I think this idealization is in part evident in the extreme vitriol directed at Skylar White. YouTuber Jack Saint has a great video that highlights some of the more insidious and insanely over-the-top score in the character and actress Anna Gunn herself, received. I have spoken before about how I find Skylar to be quite annoying, more due to her inconsistent writing, which I would say was as a result of the writers not having a grasp on what her series arc really was. But the insane level of hate and malice the character receives, even to this day, may speak to a deeper animosity some felt towards her. An animosity that was not directed towards Carmela Soprano. In Jack's video, he mentions that Carmela does get some of the same vitriol that Skylar receives, but as a big Sopranos fan, and one who I'd say is pretty tapped into the fan community, I can assure you Carmela does not receive anywhere close to the hate that Skylar does. As for why, perhaps it was because the Sopranos made pretty clear that while she may have called Tony out on his hypocrisy multiple times, it's not like her shit didn't stink. Tony is framed almost constantly as a pretty terrible person and thus Carmela calling him such didn't ruffle as many feathers. In addition to the fact that it was made pretty clear Carmela was just as hypocritical. Both Tony and Carmela are clearly framed as toxic pieces of shit. Whereas in Breaking Bad, because a portion of the audience were weirdly on Walter's side, if you will, seeing him through these rose-colored glasses, perhaps they felt as if Skylar was reigning on their parade. Being far more unreasonable and antagonistic, than she actually was. Their vitriol towards her was perhaps due to them feeling as if she was dampening their power fantasy, or reminding them of certain people in their own lives who they consider the killjoy type. To bring this back to Seinfeld, 
One of the most staggering things I came across when getting a sense of people's perceptions of the characters was that a lot of people don't actually consider them to be as horrible as they are on paper. I came across a lot of people saying they didn't actually consider the characters to be that bad and that they were quite relatable, perhaps flawed, but not terrible, which is a sentiment that I can't really agree with. Don't get me wrong, I love Seinfeld and find it hilarious, and yes, the characters do deal with the same menial issues that we all face every day and a lot of their quirks and idiosyncrasies are quite human. But again, what separates these characters from say the gang on Friends or other sitcoms is the fact that they never seem to learn any sort of lesson or change or grow or even try to at any point during the series. We all have our faults, but we constantly strive to improve ourselves, learn lessons, help others, not so much with the Seinfeld gang. I can't really see how else you could possibly classify four grown adults who do and say whatever they want regardless of who they leave in their wake or how it leads to them being perceived by the world around them and not making an effort to modify their behavior even as the ill effects of said behavior are constantly thrown in their faces as anything other than narcissistic assholes. Even in situations where they didn't mean to do awful things, such as Jerry accidentally giving booze to a recovering alcoholic, resulting in him relapsing, or Elaine not going through Jerry's mail properly, thus resulting in her not forwarding Babu Bat's visa renewal form to him, resulting in him getting deported, Again, these are simply consequences of them not truly caring about anyone else around them, and rarely do they ever show remorse or learn from their mistakes. So with all of that said, I would think that, while viewers may be able to get some satisfaction from seeing these characters act out the audience's more implicit desires, in the end, they would still want to see them get what they deserve, pay the price for not improving as human beings one iota over the course of the series. Sort of like how the audience cheered and rooted for Tony Soprano, but in the end, they still felt he needed to pay for his misdeeds. And yet in the finale, instead of feeling satisfied at seeing these characters reaping what they had sown, they felt betrayed, mocked, and offended. But why? On one hand, you could go back to the idea that, well, as you said, sometimes if the show doesn't explicitly frame certain things the characters do as wrong, even if the writer assumes the audience will know it intuitively, there is a possibility that the audience may not get the message. But you can't really apply this to Seinfeld, because in the vast majority of cases where the gang does really shitty things, they usually pay some sort of price. George bum rushing the old lady and pushing the kids from the door isn't treated as quirky, as the following scene shows George being roasted for his horrendously awful actions, which only makes the fact that they never grow as people even worse considering they suffered the consequences of their actions in lord knows how many episodes. Perhaps this was a case of the audience having rose-colored glasses, seeing themselves and the characters enough that they didn't really want to have the fact that they are pretty much inconsiderate assholes brought to their attention. But surely the writers didn't know this is how the fans would react, right? Perhaps they thought the audience would love to see these people get what was coming to them, to see karma hit them like a brick to the face. However, I don't buy this for a second. I have a pretty strong feeling that the writers knew exactly what they were doing with the final episode, primarily due to the reception of another episode earlier in the series. On May 16th, 1996, Seinfeld aired its seventh season finale, The Invitation, penned by co-creator Larry David. Those of you who are familiar with the series probably just cringed, as I'm sure you know it's coming. The main plot of the episode revolves around the impending wedding of George and Susan, despite George coming to the realization that he absolutely does not want to marry this woman. Over the course of the episode, George, the spineless little bitch that he is, tries valiantly to get Susan to be the one to call off the wedding to no avail and accepts his fate. However, it turns out that earlier in the episode, George had insisted on buying the cheapest brand of envelopes for their wedding invitations, the kind that take a lot of saliva to seal. And after Susan licks a couple hundred envelopes, she passes out due to the cheap adhesive used on the envelopes and... She's gone. What's that? <laughs> like, yeah, for real, she dies. <laughs> And if that wasn't dark enough, what follows is perhaps the most uncomfortable scene in the entire series, as George displays what would later be referred to as restrained jubilation, as he is relieved and joyous that he doesn't have to marry Susan anymore, but sort of has to act like he is sad. Then the four of them grab coffee. 
Oh yeah, and just to drive the point home about how George feels, the stinger at the end of the episode has George calling up Marissa Tomei and asking her out as he is newly single. So as you could probably guess by my lead up to this, fans were pissed, with some fans even sending in angry letters to the studio. The actress who played Susan, Heidi Swedberg, has said she has had a number of fan interactions where they expressed their displeasure about how her character met her end. Jason Alexander said it was the one of only two times where the fandom turned on George, the first being the time he ate the eclair out of the trash. Although I think we can all agree, the eclair incident was far worse. There are even rumors that before the airing, NBC execs actually tried to convince David to forego such a bleak fate for Susan, but I am sure you can all imagine how that turned out. The characters being so blasé about the death of another human being was so off-putting and mean-spirited and cruel, but also, you know, pretty much in line with exactly who these characters proved themselves to be for the last seven years. Hell, even Swedberg defended Susan's death. A lot of the show's humor is based on the fact that the main characters are not nice people. They admit to things the rest of us think, but don't like to admit. Once again, you could say they are the id of the audience, if you will. So what exactly made the audience so mad about Susan's death? It wasn't an issue of the characters acting out of character, as we have already discussed. Perhaps it was the fact that the show actually killed off a character, and using someone's actual death as a punchline was just a bit too hard to swallow despite the fact that the show had done this before, such as when Russell Darumpel was said to have died after joining Greenpeace, following him being rejected by Elaine, or Gary Fogel was shown to have been killed as a result of him getting into a car wreck while trying to adjust his toupee. However, to be fair, Russell and Gary weren't the most sympathetic characters, while Susan was pretty innocent, all things considered. The fact that the show would mercilessly kill her off and then play her demise off for laughs obviously rubbed the audience the wrong way. But is there a deeper, ulterior reason as to why? Yes, it did show, in an extremely in-your-face manner, just how narcissistic our four leads truly were, but it's not like the show suffered a significant decrease in ratings, even as the show continued to use the situation for comedy. As season 8 began, with George being named as a member of the board on a foundation in Susan's memory, much to his chagrin. And you would think if the audience was primarily upset at the characters for what they saw, as them being revealed as too unsympathetic, well, you'd think the finale, where the characters have every single selfish thing they've done thrown on their face, including their reaction following Susan's death, would be just what they would want to see. But they hated it. However, the anger wasn't directed at the characters in the show, but rather at the show itself for going there, if you will. For crossing some line, Susan's death and the reaction it spurred are quite reminiscent to the similar reactions the audience had to Homer's enemy. You can actually draw a number of parallels between Susan and Frank Grimes. Like Frank, Susan was more of a straight woman, if you will. As opposed to being over the top or as idiosyncratic as the other characters, she was pretty level-headed. Just like Grimes does with Homer, Susan eventually becomes tired and impatient with the antics of George and his friends. Although I think we can agree that Kramer wasn't really given a fair shake by her. I mean, all he did was vomit on her, burn her father's cabin down, steal her girlfriend, and he seldom remembered her name, even after her death. Poor Lily. <laughs> The indifference shown by the attendees of Frank's funeral and the main characters from Seinfeld after the deaths of Frank and Susan respectively is also quite similar. And of course, both episodes were met with quite the polarizing reception. However, to go back to my earlier point, there is a significant difference in the framing of both shows. Whereas in The Simpsons, or some of the other sitcoms I have mentioned thus far, there is an emotional center, some sort of lesson or redeeming aspect to the characters or story. And this is why the more wacky antics and or awful stuff the characters may do is sort of overlooked, as it is more about connecting to and empathizing with the characters. But with Seinfeld, there never is that emotional center. No lesson, no redemption. Audience were upset when Frank Grimes was killed in The Simpsons because it was in sharp contrast to the rest of the show, almost as if the creators we're pulling the rug out from under us, saying these are characters you are meant to relate to and invest in, and then suddenly making you feel guilty for doing so. Again, it felt like they were breaking the deal made with that invisible handshake. But in Seinfeld, Susan's death and our character's indifference to it was not a pull the rug out moment, 
It was pretty par for the course, simply an extension of the fact that our characters don't give a damn about anyone other than themselves. I have had people tell me straight up they don't find this show funny at all as the tone of the show is so cynical and mean-spirited if you will. It seemed like the audience treated Seinfeld like the sitcoms of old despite it being an anti-sitcom in many ways, where they thought you were supposed to invest in these characters, when in reality, I don't think that is what the creators intended whatsoever, given just how awful human beings they are shown to be. The reason people actually came to like these characters was, not because of anything the characters do, or how the show is framed, but because they were conditioned to, if you will, by pretty much every other sitcom that asks the audience to actually like these characters. To go back to a show like It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, like with Seinfeld, the characters are all clearly horrible people. But I would argue everyone who watches this show is able to understand this. Whereas with Seinfeld, as I said, there were a lot of people who didn't see them as bad as I would say they objectively are. Perhaps Seinfeld was simply so ahead of its time, so revolutionary, in how it betrayed almost every custom of the sitcom that the audience simply didn't know how to respond to it, as if they couldn't believe a show would seriously follow the antics of such horrifically subpar individuals with no redeeming qualities that they must actually be characters we are meant to connect with, even if the creators never wanted us to in the first place. And with all of that said, that leaves a single question. If the creators made these characters so over the top selfish and narcissistic and conceited and openly displayed that they had absolutely no redeeming qualities, making the show constantly self-aware that these were not characters you should sympathize with, and you still did, well, what exactly does that say about you? As I mentioned in the opening of this video, I originally intended to just focus on the finale itself and defend it against its infamously bad reputation. But again, as I was trying to do so, I had nothing to discuss. The ending is pitch perfect. It keeps the characterization of the main cast consistent and finally makes them pay for every horribly selfish act they had done throughout the series. And yet there were many who hated this seemingly thematically consistent finale. Which leads the question, how the hell did they expect it to end? Like other sitcoms usually do? where the characters are all having a touching final moment together, where they cherish the good times they have had together, where it is so evident how each of them have grown and changed and serves as the culmination of all the lessons they've learned and relationships they've formed. But what do you do when there really weren't that many good times, or no growth or change, or any lessons learned or relationships formed? I suppose we could have had a nice send off with the characters sharing a tearful goodbye, perhaps having Jerry and Elaine get together, as so many fans want for some reason, I suppose because the whole will they won't they thing has been such a driving force behind other shows. But what I found while doing research for this video was that, any negative or lukewarm review I came across, it was like the person who wrote it didn't even watch the same show that I did. The complaint that seemed consistent throughout the reviews was that they didn't like how the characters were framed as bad people particularly how they just stood by and watched a man get mugged without doing anything. I mean, they may not be the most likable people, but they aren't monsters, right? Hey, remember that scene where neither Jerry nor Newman wanted to give the unconscious pool guy mouth to mouth and just sat there and did nothing until luckily other bystanders showed up and saved the man's life? I could have died. Yeah, it was a gamble. <laughs> Jeez, those, those, those wacky scoundrels. In another video of mine, I spoke about how I actually found the Breaking Bad finale, despite its unanimous praise, to be thematically inconsistent with the rest of the show, and that Walter, I felt, was framed as a tragic character. But right at the end, he was basically given the chance to redeem himself, something the audience enjoyed seeing. This is sort of what I feel happened with the Seinfeld characters, that despite the bad things they had done over the series, the audience still wanted to see them get a fairy tale ending to some extent. The question I would ask those who wanted a more typical heartwarming ending for these characters is that regardless of what you want, do you think these characters deserve said ending? Outside of that, a lot of the negative reviews were strangely unspecific, like they didn't know why they didn't like it, they didn't specify what they wanted to see happen, they just didn't like what they got. They don't know why it left such a bad taste in their mouth, it just did. This is perhaps the most fascinating thing about the finale. I could go on for hours, and I have, about the many reasons as to why the Game of Thrones finale was a letdown. But when it comes to Seinfeld, it's more of a feeling as opposed to any sort of concrete reason. A lot of the negative reviews I read even stated they understood the point of the ending and that it was in fact thematically consistent with the show, but they just didn't like it. 
And this is why I spend so long going over the relationship between media and the audience and framing and psychology. It was all an attempt to understand. And the theory I am left with is that people relate to these characters in a way that I don't even know if the creators intended them to. The characters were the personification of the id of the audience. And the show was, to them, saying, it's okay to be like this. It's okay to do these things someone understands. It doesn't mean you are evil or a villain, but then in the finale, when the show threw every single horrible thing these characters have done on their face, chastising them for finding humor in the suffering of others, and saying they were bad people for relating to these characters, well, of course they were pissed. They were using these characters as a sort of proxy to act out their own not so socially acceptable desires, perhaps even on a semi-subconscious level, without having to deal with any real world consequences or feel guilt or remorse, and then had that ripped away from them. Perhaps this is another piece of supporting evidence to the idea that the reason the finale was so hated was due to the audience being conditioned by sitcoms of the past. Despite the finale being thematically consistent, it simply didn't end the way sitcoms usually end, and thus, people didn't vibe with that shit. Obviously, I have been quite presumptuous throughout this video, but I can't really see any other explanation as to the harsh reception to what, on paper, is such a thematically perfect conclusion to the show. But then that leaves the question as to whether or not the creators knew this is how the show would be received. Did they believe the fans would love this ending, or did they simply go with the ending they thought was appropriate and didn't foresee just how badly fans would react to it. Or, as I alluded to before, was the hostile reaction towards the finale not only foreseen, but the intended effect of the episode. It should be noted that the series finale was written by Mr. Larry David himself, which marked his return to the show after his last penned episode, which was the season 7 finale, which just so happened to be The Invitations, the episode that caused the reaction quite similar to that of the finale. In his negative review of the finale, Ken Tucker of Entertainment Weekly wrote, This crew led miserable lives, and we relished their exceptional pettiness. That they should be punished for all the vicarious fun we had at their expense is David's way of saying we never should have made these cruel losers must-see worthy. So, to indulge in my presumptuous self, is it possible that Larry David saw the reaction that the invitations received, sort of realized that perhaps the audience was siding with the characters a bit more than what he and Jerry Seinfeld originally intended, and then concocted a scheme by penning an ending where the characters, and thus the audience themselves, is put on trial, has every single character from the entire series call them out, and finally has the judge deliver unto them a scathing indictment, basically calling them all selfish assholes who should feel ashamed for actually liking these pieces of shit, thus making one of the most revolutionary sitcoms of all time into a gigantic 10-year social experiment that captured the collective id of America and then called them on it right in the end? God, I fucking hope so, because it would be fucking hilarious to know Larry David fucking bodied an entire country that fucking hard. Yeah, you know what, um, I, I'm, I'm just gonna go with that.